Welcome to all the attendees and panelists for the last open training session on review writing. I hope you all have been taking good care of yourselves. Today's webinar is split in two presentations. The first part will be covered by me and the second part by Dr. Tanushri Banerjee. Both of us would be talking about tools and techniques in scientific writing where we would share some information about the tools that can be useful in accomplishing the huge task of literature survey and will facilitate the assembly of knowledge, finding the gaps and the choice of journal and representation of data for compiling your review article. In our previous sessions, a couple of times I have mentioned about mind mapping as a powerful tool to make notes and to make reading easy and effortless. Well, but this is not a magical wand. There is some time still to reach to a stage when artificial intelligence would do the literature survey and would find out the gaps in the knowledge for you. It may happen in future, but then we would eventually be making machines more intelligent than humans. So, in my opinion, we should give more power to our brain than to the machines. Thus, it would be nice if we read a lot of articles, churn the information, assemble, analyze the information ourselves to actually find the topic which needs attention. So, what is mind mapping? To describe in the simplest possible way, mind mapping is a graphical or a diagrammatic representation of your thoughts. You have to identify the conceptual point, highlight it and build a framework around it. Use of attractive graphics builds your creativity and makes learning interesting. Besides this, it is easy to memorize concepts by using attractive graphics. In this slide, you can see a mind map for writing a research paper. As you can see, this is the first step to understand and gather the guidelines from the instructor, which I think most of you have done. And also, you need to gather information from other sources. You have to choose the topic and decide whether your paper is analytical or argumentative. In case of an analytical paper, the available research has to be examined and a research question has to be posed and answered. If the paper is argumentative, then the authors would have to approve a hypothesis or take a stand with substantial evidence. The thesis statement must be supported with evidence and with logical reasoning. The next point is that one has to determine the focus or the scope of the paper and prepare the basic framework. Then you proceed with approval from your mentor. You now actually begin your research and work on the literature and prepare notes including the sources from where you got the particular information. This generates your bibliography. Now you start Preparing the framework of your paper, adapt the evidence which you have and discuss the literature for validation of similarities and differences as well as novel concepts which you can identify. This pen down of your thoughts gives the first draft which has to be proofread till the final approved version is completely ready for submission. This slide is just an example of how to use mind map for basic types of rocks, gives their properties and examples. This is just to show you how a lot of information can be summarized in a single mind map. Moving more towards a biological mind map, this is a graphical representation which is adapted from the color atlas of immunology. And this illustrates the phagocyte system. 
the map or representation is so simple that a person with some basic knowledge can understand the apparent concept if the full forms are provided. In-depth understanding, of course, would require more reading. So how to mind map in the best possible way? A mind map is also known as a brainstorm or a spider diagram. The central idea has to be noted and placed at the center of the page, a drawing board or a software. Then you have to choose the sub areas and allow them to radiate out from the center. You should write only short words in a map. If you use small and simple sketches or drawings to attract attention, then that makes the map more interesting. Mind mapping can be done on plain paper, on a whiteboard, or even on a computer screen, as there are plenty of mapping softwares that are readily available for creating artistic and attractive maps. For example, MindView, MindGenius, MindManager, and Iowa. Some softwares have to be downloaded on your computer, whereas some are cloud-based. And you can log in from anywhere and use the software, besides getting an access to unfinished works that you might have left halfway. Later in this presentation, I shall be discussing how the information was extracted from an earlier published review article using mind mapping. If you all remember, Professor Pal in his first session on review writing had shown a synthesis matrix in Excel, which gave us an idea how Excel can be used actually to do literature survey and to compile information. This matrix is a very useful tool to categorize various information, questions, arguments for a particular topic or a particular concept. A synthesis matrix generally comprises of a study summary table, source evaluation, and finally the synthesis matrix itself. There are several versions of such matrices which are available and you can find some of these versions in the links which are given in these slides. This slide is an example of a study summary table. As you can see here, first, you have to indicate the source of information and the date. In particular, you are going to describe the authors who have written the article from where you have taken the information. This is followed by the main topic this on which the study was conducted, the population of study, so what area on which the study was entirely framed, what were the results and conclusions, what were the limitations of the study, what are the connections of this particular study with other studies and relation to the present project. The next slide shows the example of source evaluation where again you see the source author and the year of publication. The next column describes whether the information is current or it is old information. What is the relevance of this information for your work? Do the authors have an authority over the subject? How accurate is this information? What gaps or inconsistencies do you notice in this research? What was the purpose and the target audience? And whether there are any bias approach or biasness that can be identified in the research. This slide shows the actual synthesis matrix where each theme is connected to each source. And one has to describe how each source connects to or provides 
knowledge about each theme. This matrix is the final that you would refer to locate the gaps and identify the areas where you would like to provide the probable solutions. As mentioned, there are numerous versions of these matrices. When I started teaching at DPU way back in 2008, I had created these matrices which I called as scriptors and I have renamed them as rescriptors, research writers. There are four sheets that can be used to assemble and gather information plus identify the key questions that you would like to cover or address through your review. These sheets have been called as res scriptor 1, 2, 3 and 4. This slide shows the res scriptor 1 which is actually a list of articles that you got when you used specific keyword. For each keyword, one such sheet is preferred to have a minimum of 20 articles in the list. These 20 articles are the first hits you get when you use a database or a search engine. You can create separate sheets for individual keywords and for combination of keywords. The combination of keywords is used to check the redundancy of the articles that appear in different databases and search engines. Even if you have the same keywords, there is a possibility of getting different hits from different sources. This also assures that we do not miss out important articles. Once your list is ready, using pure logic, you have to read the title with an unbiased mind and filter out the articles that are not at all relevant to your topic of interest. You do not delete them from your list. Instead, you highlight those articles which you select. The next slide shows the rescripted too. And in this, you prepare short summaries of the articles which you have selected in the rescriptor 1. You do not read the full paper or the full review here but you read only the abstract and derive the information from the abstract. You derive the aim of the article, the probable methods that are enlisted by the authors or if not, you anticipate certain methods which must have been used. You list out the experiments which are mentioned by the authors or which you think must have been done by the authors in order to carry out the study. Then you give brief results. You have to only give highlights of the results in these sheets. And finally, you briefly mention the conclusion which was derived by the authors. The second last column is whether the author has indicated the objective was met or not and if the objectives were not met then what reasons for the failure have been given. In case if the author needs to do future work then what future work has to be done should also be mentioned in the last column. This would give us an idea about gaps in the current knowledge. With this information, one can screen out papers which are most relevant for your work. The next slide shows the res scriptor 3 where the abstracts were read properly and the articles which were most relevant were selected for further study. Res scriptor 3 is similar to the res scriptor 2 except that here you are making the rescriptor 3 after reading the full paper whereas rescriptor 2 was made only by reading the abstract. Also you will notice that in this sheet the last three columns have to be strictly filled 
based on your own opinion and your own thoughts. You have to describe whether you think that the objective was achieved or not. You have to list out any questions which came to your mind while you were reading the article. And what were the probable answers which you derived? For each article, a different sheet has to be used. This slide shows the Rescriptor 4, which is the last descriptor in the sequence. Here, you will use different sheets for different articles again. And in this sheet, you have to list out the questions which are raised by the authors and the answers given by the authors. Now you have to critically list out your own questions from the which you have framed from the article and your own answers which you could reach when you completed uh, the reading of this whole paper or review. You have to also indicate the possible solutions to the questions or the problems. So you are going to draw your own conclusions you are going to identify the gaps and you are going to enlist all this. The last step is very important. If you have identified a gap in the knowledge, you have to be double sure that it is indeed a gap. So you have to verify by using more specific keywords and just hit the literature review once again. You have to look for a literature using very, very specific keywords now. And once you are sure that the gap which you have identified is indeed there, that becomes the focus point of your study. And you start articulating the information around this central point or central issue. Now in the next few slides, I would be giving example of a mind map created based on information in one of the review articles selected as an example. This review selected as an example is one of the simplest reviews as it is very straightforward and the topic is itself a straight question. It is published in the journal Clinica Chimica Acta and the publisher is Elsevier Inc. INC. You can see that it is classified as a review. It was published in 2017 with a volume number 469, page number 152-160. The article's cross mark indicates the authoritative inf uh, version of the document and also would provide more information on the document if you click on it. The article title is Methods of Albumin Estimation in Clinical Biochemistry, Past, Present and Future. And it is authored by Deepak Kumar and Dibya Jyoti Banerjee. Dibya Jyoti Banerjee is the corresponding author and the affiliation is PGI Mer Chandigarh. The keywords enlisted by the authors are human serum albumin, microalbumin urea, glycated albumin, diabetic nephropathy, nephrotic syndrome, point of care, and pseudoesterase. So if you use these keywords or related keywords, this article should appear. Although, if you see carefully, the only common word in abstract title and keywords is the word albumin. Now in this slide, mind map of the abstract is created. If you read the mind map, the center point of focus is albumin estimation, which is a routine practice 
and it is estimated from serum samples and urine samples in a clinical biochemistry lab. The right side of the map shows the abstract is highlighting the methods that have been used in the past, present and which are likely to be used in the future. Past methods include precipitation methods, present ones work on the dye binding or immunochemical methods of estimation and future methods would perhaps be new methods or the methods which have overcome limitations of the existing ones. Now this slide gives the mind map of the introduction part that has been split as per the subtopics or sub areas. In this case, the introduction is split into two main subtopics. First is the introduction to albumin, its protein characteristics, its gene and gene family information. And the other part talks about the methods which have not been recently reviewed but are useful in estimation of albumin. So this definitely is a gap in the knowledge because several methods have not been reviewed. Further, the significance of these methods which are frequently required and particularly because this test is very important in clinical diagnosis, the methods have to be very, very specific and a large variety of methods are already available. So it's a kind of validation of certain methods and comparison that which method is better and whether we can come up with new methods which have higher specificity and which are more user friendly. So this information is generated in a radial map as you can see here. Now this slide shows the mind map for the remaining parts of the introduction in which the properties of albumin are described. Now why should we discuss the properties of albumin? Because with this information we can come to know whether albumin binds to specific ligands, to which metal ions does it bind, what are the binding properties and once we know this there is a possibility that we can introduce new methods for its estimation. Now one of the most important factors in clinical biochemistry is the presence of abnormal variants of albumin that may arise under different pathological conditions. So the methods which are used for albumin estimation must either be specific for these variants or must be able to also take into account these variants. So one might need more specific or new methods to measure these. Now this slide, the authors continue in the introduction to highlight the function of albumin as a transport protein and other physiological functions of albumin. Now this is an important slide where the remaining part of the introduction which actually is focusing on the methods which are used in albumin estimation are highlighted. So this is a mind map created for the methods used in albumin estimation which have been described by these authors and this is the central focus of the whole article. Now as you can see right side of the map shows the clinical relevance of the albumin estimation like nephrotic syndrome, microalbumin urea, renal failure, prognosis of cancer and so on. The left side highlights the historical aspects of different types of methods of albumin estimation. For example, caloric methods, calorimetric methods like fallen phenol method, precipitation methods using trichloroacetic acid, picric acid, 
and phosphotungstic acid. Electrophoretic methods and then dye binding methods. The dye binding method branch enlists seven different dyes and also highlights the limitation or the positive aspect of those methods in terms of sensitivity, specificity, interference, which enables us to know the scope of the present methods and the areas where an improvement is required. Now this slide shows how the authors have tabulated these methods along with the limitations, special features and the reported quality control parameters. Finally, this slide shows the concluding remarks and for indicating the concluding remarks, you can see that you can create a simple table where you can highlight the gaps, the conclusions and the solutions. So as you can see, the authors have identified two gaps. Number one is that there is a need of affordable point of care detection system for microalbumin urea and for glycated albumin. So you need a detection system for both microalbumin and for glycated albumin. Second is you need improvement in quality control parameters which is very very critical because you are doing clinical biochemistry. Apart from the gaps which they have identified, the authors are also giving a conclusion. They are concluding that albumin in a diseased state can have different binding properties. And again, this also is a gap in the knowledge because if they have different binding properties, the existing methods may not really work well for them. Then they are also providing two solutions. Number one is the possibility of using the approach of pseudoesterase activity for the detection of microalbumin urea. And they are also trying to emphasize that user friendly technologies are required and they can be developed using the above approach. Now, this slide shows the last part of the article, which is the acknowledgement. Deepak Kumar is acknowledging the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research for providing the fellowship. And this is followed by references. Only two references are shown over here, although the reference list in the original article is very long. So I hope that I could give you some useful tools to make your literature review exercise a bit simple and creative. I have given due credits to the authors Deepak Kumar and Dibya Jyoti Banerjee for using their article as a teaching reference. Further, I give due credit to Iowa, a mind mapping software for creating the mind maps which I have used in this presentation only for educational purpose. Finally, I thank all the attendees, the panelists and the IT department as well as all the activity coordinators and thank you everyone for your patient listening. Uh, I'm sure this presentation is going to make your job simpler and of course in the question answer session I'll be happy to answer any questions further. Be safe and be healthy and take care of yourself. Good day.